The way I think about it, there are two ways to consider polymers. One way is in the last chapter, polymers as molecules. So where we consider that polymers derive their properties from the molecular structure. That is the way that atoms bond to one another and the way that different types of polymerization strategies yield polymer sample distributions with different molecular weights and thus different bulk properties. By bulk properties, I mean things like hardness, toughness, thermal conductivity, optical properties, things like that. The other way to think about polymers is how the microstructure or the morphology, like how those polymer chains pack in the solid state influences those properties. Now clearly you can't have one without the other, so you can't have something where the microstructure determines everything or the molecular structure determines everything. Typically the molecular structure is the more like important thing because without that you don't have the morphology. You can't, there's no way to get a morphology. So the first thing to know about polymer morphology is that there is never a completely 100%, 100.000% perfectly crystalline sample. So it's not like you can just have a salt crystal of a polymer where every atom completely uh, repeats over and over and over again. And the reason is because you have chain ends, you have branching, you have different molecular weights of polymer molecules in the same sample, and all of those little chain ends create free volume in the system. And that free volume is what creates the ability for that polymer to deform in part, because if everything was completely locked together uh, tight, you would, have a, uh, you would have a pretty immobile polymer structure. The best you can do is something called uh, is something called polycrystalline, which is mostly crystalline, like more than ninety nine percent. That is really hard to achieve. Um, maybe some organic media can do it, uh, but it's really hard for like a polymer sample to do it unless they're all exactly like the same molecular weight. So you might be able to get like a polycrystalline sample of a protein. I mean, you can get a single crystalline sample of a protein, so polycrystalline should be possible as well. Whether or not we want to call a protein a polymer, well, that's a little bit debatable. At least it's a macromolecule, a big molecule. So crystalline segments have a transition called the TM, the melting temperature. The melting temperature is associated with a latent heat. It's the amount of energy you need to put in to break all the van der Waals bonds in the crystal structure. And so that is the main phase transition. It's a first order phase transition. It means that after that phase transition, there's an abrupt change in properties like the specific volume, the density, and other types of properties that we associate with condensed phases of matter. Next, we have a semi-crystalline sample, which is pretty common for structures that have some order. Um, and a semi-crystalline sample has crystalline regions, which have a TM, and they also have amorphous regions. And the amorphous regions don't have a regular repeating structure, hence amorphous, and they are characterized by a transition called the TG, the glass transition temperature, where below the TG, the material Material is frozen like frozen spaghetti. Uh, so suppose you cook the spaghetti, then it becomes all loose and intertwined, and then you freeze it. That's the, that's the phase I'm talking about. Then above the glass transition temperature, it's like cooked spaghetti um, that can kind of ooze around and the, the strands can slide past each other. So the, the, the semi-crystalline sample thus has a TM and a TG. So above the TG, the material becomes a little bit more elastic, and above the TM, the material is a melt. If you have a material that operates in between the TG and a TM, chances are it's an elastomer. An elastomer means elastic polymer. There are a lot of well-known examples of polymers that exist between a TG and a, and a, a TM. 
Finally, we have an amorphous material. An amorphous material has a molecular structure which doesn't allow for complete ordering, as in crystallites. So the, uh, so the amorphous material has only a TG, so picture polystyrene. Polystyrene like styrofoam or a plastic drinking cup or a, uh, a plastic petri dish that has just a TG. And it has just a TG because there's something about it that doesn't permit the ordering. Taking the example of polystyrene a little bit further, most polystyrene is atactic. So polystyrene is a type of polyolefin that has a, uh, that's derived from a vinyl monomer, in this case, vinyl benzene, AKA styrene. And you can make it into a bunch of different structures. What I'm showing here is an example for polypropylene. Polypropylene is derived from like vinyl, like, uh, uh, propene, so it's three carbon atoms where uh, there's a double bond between two of the carbon atoms. And when you polymerize propylene, you could get three different things. You could get uh, isotactic material where they all point, all those methyl groups point the same way. You could get syndiotactic where they point in opposite directions, but they alternate, and atactic. And atactic means that the orientation is random. And that atactic material, in the case of polypropylene, polystyrene, and other materials, mean that the material itself is almost for sure going to be amorphous because with all that irregularity you don't have enough regularity to get uh, to get crystalline behavior so atactic polypropylene is kind of like a gum like substance isotactic polypropylene is more of like what carpet is made of and polypropylene drinking containers and clamshell packaging for food and stuff and syndiotactic polypropylene you don't hear much about um, but there are probably a couple of industrial applications for that uh, uh, material as well. Polystyrene has the same sort of thing. Most, most polystyrene is atactic. However, since you have that big benzene group, there are a lot of van der Waals forces, and that material is quite solid and glassy until you get to about 100 degrees Celsius, at which point it melts. It doesn't melt in the sense that it goes above its melting temperature because it's not, strictly speaking, thermodynamically a melting transition, but it gets really gummy and, be and liquefies. So if that's not melting, I don't know what is, but that's when it goes above its glass transition temperature. So uh, next up, we want to consider the structures of materials in the crystalline phases. Now, when these structures, when, when van der Waals solids uh, nucleate, um, and this is true of, mo of most polymer systems that have some amount of chain flexibility in them, they form these three-dimensional snowflakes called, called spherulites. And it starts out in the middle and it kind of grows out like a three-dimensional tree or a three-dimensional snowflake, where within each little branch of that snowflake, the polymer axis is, um, is actually perpendicular to the axis of that uh, of that that dendrite or that spine of the snowflake, and you can kind of see it in this drawing here. In between all of those little dendrites are uh, amorphous material, and that amorphous material is what uh, kind of assures that that structure can never be completely crystalline. And crystallites are never totally spherical. And the reason they're not totally spherical is that when they grow, say you melt a polymer and then you cool it down and those spherulites grow out, they impinge upon one another and they prevent themselves from, full, from uh, becoming complete spheres. Next, uh, I want to mention something about how you characterize the volume of a, uh, of a polymer, and this goes actually for any van der Waals solid, uh, where first you have at the lowest level the van der Waals volume, and that's literally the, the volume of every sphere, uh, spherical molecule or molecule based on, the, uh, based on the electron cloud, like how much space does that electron cloud carve out? 
Then uh, if you add another 45% to that volume, that's the packing volume. If you have a, you know, spheres that are close packed, you get about 45% um, more volume just by considering the space in between the spheres. And then you have the expansion volume. And above the glass transition temperature, when the molecules start to, um, start to increase their interparticle spacing, the, uh, that uh, packing volume actually uh, increases because the molecules get farther apart. And that, uh, that starts to occur around Tg. And at that point, you get about 60% more volume than the van der Waals volume, and then it continues to increase thereafter. One of the ways that you mention or that you measure these transition temperatures is by way of differential scanning calorimetry, and I'm showing a <laughs> showing a plot here where the first transition that you see occurs at the glass transition temperature, which occurs within uh, an increase in heat capacity, and that's because you're freeing up these modes of molecular motion so you can absorb more heat without raising the temperature that much then at a certain point you're going to give the material enough uh, energy to uh, to um, for that amorphous stuff to crystallize and at some at some later temperature those crystallites are going to melt and anytime you're forming uh, bonds uh, like um, like crystallization it's going to be exothermic so forming bonds releases heat just like a regular um, covalent bond releases heat, and anytime that those bonds get disrupted, it's endothermic, it takes heat in. Thinking about mechanical properties, if you have a an amorphous polymer that you start out at a glass and then you increase the temperature, there's a huge drop off in modulus around the glass transition temperature. Then it becomes more leathery and then more rubbery and then finally a viscoelastic liquid all the way at the end. That's like a gummy liquid that, uh, that just flows, um, uh, that flows quite slowly but still flows and doesn't maintain its shape. The definition of stress and strain is here. So stress is the force divided by the cross-sectional area of the workpiece, and the strain is the fractional increase in length. So it's delta L over, uh, over L naught. Sometimes that's expressed as a percentage, so times 100%. If you plot the uh, force versus the displacement and you have the dimensions of the material, you can easily convert that into a stress versus strain curve. And here's an example of a stress versus strain curve that you might get for a, uh, for a polymer. And at the beginning of the stress strain curve, you have this elastic regime where there's a linear relationship between stress and strain. And then finally, the material might yield. Uh, consider that this could be like a polyethylene plastic bag or something. And it stretches just a little bit and then you, you um, and it returns, but you can't stretch it by much, maybe 10%. And then it, you disrupt those crystallites, the crystallites yield, and then you stretch it out, you start stretching strain aligning those, uh, those chains. Uh, there may be a lower yield point um, where it just takes less force to continue to stretch it, but then at some point, all those polymer crystallites are gonna be disrupted and then realign and they're gonna get really, really strong because all your molecular axes are now aligned along the stretching direction like a bunch of ropes and it becomes much stronger, much harder to pull that polymer apart until Finally, it fractures. One more comment I want to make is that if you have a polymer chain that's long enough, it does something called entangle. And entangle means that those polymer chains become looped around each other and they can't, uh, they can't slide past each other. And that, uh, that entanglement molecular weight, once you reach it, the material becomes a lot stronger. See you next time.